I would like to bring in Yahoo Finance's editor in chief, and Andy Serwer. And you have the ear of the C-suite. I know you have been talking to so many CEOs and business leaders throughout this pandemic. What are you hearing from them? Well, Julia, first of all, um, I think there's been an abrupt change. To be quite honest with you, mental health has been sort of a sideshow at work. And to the extent that chief executives even thought about mindfulness, often they would just bring in a consultant and sort of leave it at that. But now with all this working at home, Mental health has taken a new urgency and it's become a front and center issue. So now executives and other managers are having to deal with mental health and mindfulness on a day to day basis. And it's calling for new strategies, new ways of coping with working with people and making sure they're engaged and working well within the organization. So we're starting to see just a whole new way of work beginning to unfold. Uh, Andy, I'm, I'm, glad, and I'm glad that you brought up strategy because you're right. I think businesses are starting to rethink strategy and that mental health is a smart strategy in the workplace. And our next guest, um, I'm so pleased to welcome Mark Bertolini, the former CEO of Aetna, along with Johnson & Johnson's Chief Human Resources Officer. Peter Fasolo to talk about mental wellness in the workplace. Uh, Mark Bertolini, I want to start with you because I know that mental wellness, mindfulness, it's so personal to you. You have these two life events that were really changing for you and it changed the way that you ran Aetna. I was hoping you could share with our viewers about your own experience. Yeah, I think as a result of um, having to sit with my son for a year in the hospital as he fought cancer and my own accident, I realized that the system was not set up to create or recreate the human experience for you after you got well, quote unquote. It was more about you got well, the thing that you had that was wrong was fixed and you could go back into your world. And I very quickly realized that the whole person needed to be addressed when re-entering the world that they used to be in, realizing both that it's not gonna be normal like it was before, that you had to reinvent yourself to some degree and you had to have a set of practices that allowed you to see the world in a different way and a more productive way and a more wholesome way. And, and Peter, I know that at Johnson & Johnson, you have talked about creating the healthiest workforce. And I'm wondering how mental health, uh, the mindfulness, the mental well-being plays into that strategy and what kind of results you all have seen. Well, Julia, first of all, thank you for having me. And we do at Johnson & Johnson look at the health of our employees in the most holistic way. We set out goals to have the healthiest workforce on the planet. And that means mentally healthy, spiritually healthy, nutritionally healthy, and emotionally healthy. And we have a range of programs and approaches to do that. And we just like Mark's experience at Aetna, we have uh, tried to really look at the outcomes of this. But we also understand that Employees don't check themselves at the door when they come into the uh, facilities at Johnson & Johnson. So we want to make sure that people are looking at their lives in the, in the richest, most comprehensive manner. And now with COVID-19, it has become even more paramount as close to two-thirds of our workforce are working from home and dealing with the array of balances that they have to deal with, child care, elder care, uh, bouts of loneliness, and staying connected and collaborating in ways to ensure that mental health is at the forefront of what our employees are doing is even more important now than it ever has been. Yeah, and Mark, um, Peter was just referencing the, the investments they made. I know at Aetna, you did the same thing. And we've had this conversation about investing in human capital and it's something that needs to be addressed. And I was wondering if you think that part of it has to do with maybe a broken capitalist system that we have right now and how you think we might rethink that on the other side of this crisis. I think it is a broken system and we do need to rethink it. Um, people have been rethinking it, but I think we've been given lip service to the kinds of changes that need to happen. I think we measure, we've been measuring our economy for a long time on six financial flow of funds to determine the economy's health. And we looked at sort of, tangentially productivity and skill sets as, as part of that solution. But what we really haven't realized is that the human condition in and of itself, where people live, how they live, 
the kind of circumstances they have when they're not at work actually do matter. And that's come fully to the fore here as we've gone through this, this crisis. This crisis has opened up a very clear idea where one little bug can actually shut down the world's economy and actually on a monthly basis, $350 billion is the toll that this is taking on our economy is actually more than we spend on healthcare on a monthly basis. Well, that's a really startling statistic that you just brought up more than we spend on healthcare. Um, really incredible stuff. I, I want to ask you, Peter, uh, for your reaction to investing in human capital, rethinking that um, in the workplace. Do you think that's something that's going to start to change on the other side of this? Well, I think uh, companies like Johnson & Johnson and other global corporations need to continuously remind themselves that when it comes to the health and wellness of your employees, you have to think in terms of prevention, wellness. I think Mark's right. Is By the time it gets to the outcome, you're trying to fix things and sometimes it's a bit too late or it gets more complicated or more expensive. And what we try to do at Johnson & Johnson is invest heavily in prevention, wellness, in terms of know your numbers, ensure that you're taking mental health breaks, that we have healthy cafeteria, fitness centers, and make sure that people access uh, to programs like EAP and resiliency training and fitness training. No one program or, in, or intervention is going to hit the uh, specific outcome you're looking for. It's the strategy and the holistic approach you take to, to, towards your employees, which is an investment model, which is a commitment model and an engagement model so that you have a long-term investment in your employees. Because most companies like Johnson & Johnson are in the innovation business and you need employees to bring their whole selves to work. And you have to make sure that you're protecting them and that you're keeping them safe and that you're investing behind them. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that's really remarkable to me is that you're seeing the return on investment, if you will. There is an economic benefit to investing in your people. Um, Mark Bertolini, going back to what you just mentioned earlier, the fact that we're spending so much on healthcare yet, we really aren't seeing the outcomes. Um, I think even of the OECD nations, we spend more yet we don't see the value. Do you think that we're, I guess, how could we fix that system? It just seems like it's broken right now. Well, I think we have to, and business people for, for, for decades have been trained to steward scarce resources and to put at risk plentiful resources. And for a long time, the scarce resources were financial resources and the plentiful resources were people. Just put another person on the line, train somebody else on the job to do this work, put somebody behind a terminal screen or on the phone. I think what's happened since probably the early 70s, what we've seen is a flip where financial capital is now plentiful and human capital is very scarce. Well-trained people who know how to learn and continually evolve with the kind of organization they're in. And we have not made those investments because quite frankly, as business people, we aren't rewarded by the tax system to do so. We can't depreciate our investment in people like we can in the machines. So machines are a better economic spreadsheet outcome than people are, and I think we've lost our way as a result. So we've got to turn that around, start re spending more money in education. The single biggest thing we can do to restore the American dream and to improve the quality of our human capital over time is in K-3 to education, where we teach people how to learn, how to read. We should stop teaching to tests, standardized tests, and teach these children how to learn based on the circumstances they're in. On the other side of it, we then need, with people that know how to learn, the ability to reskill people for the communities they live in, not necessarily for some job halfway across the country. Because social mobility, geographic mobility, labor mobility is all but stopped while people stay in their communities where their families are and their social networks are. Mark Bertolini, former CEO of Aetna, and Peter Fasolo, the Chief Human Resources Officer of Johnson & Johnson. Thank you both for your time. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Julia.